Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Legal 500 webinar sponsored by Wolf Tice, Anti-Corruption, Compliance and Investigations in the Age of Remote Working and Collaboration. My name is Joe Boswell. I'm a senior member of the Legal 500's in-house legal research team, and I'll be introducing today's session. We are very lucky to have an excellent panel here to discuss today's topic with a mix of both practical advice and technical knowledge set to be dispensed during the next 90 minutes that will help legal practitioners of all experience levels tackle the complex issues surrounding anti-corruption and compliance initiatives. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type these into the Q&A function and we'll do our best to put these to the panel at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to throw over to our moderator, Yitka, who is going to lead the discussion today. Thank you very much uh, for the great introduction. And I have to say, uh, I'm uh, very pleased uh, to see that we have uh, such a really large audience. And I'm very much looking forward to hopefully very active and lively uh, discussion round at the end of our approximately 60 hour uh, panel discussion. Uh, as mentioned already, we have uh, hopefully uh, uh, put together a very interesting uh, panel. We have different uh, sectors uh, involved in the panel or represented on the panel. We have uh, different experience. We have in-house counsel. We have external counsel. We have sector-wise representatives from a life science sector, medical. We have commercial sector representative, automotive. We have external legal advisors and we have external um, investigation, um, well, general uh, kind of advisory. Um, we should start probably uh, with the introduction of the individual uh, panelists. I would like to start uh, with myself, of course. Uh, as mentioned already, I have the pl pleasure to moderate the panel uh, today. I also had the pleasure to put the panel together. Uh, we had prepared, I, I'm quite convinced, very interesting set of topics and questions we would like to discuss uh, first of all um, together among the panelists and then share our views uh, with, with you subsequently, of course. My name is Jitka Logesova. Uh, I am partner at Wolf Dice and in charge of regional uh, corporate investigation practice group. We cover 13 countries in Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe. We have uh, Caroline Moffers. Um, she is um, SFP, Chief Compliance and uh, Integrity Officer at uh, Electa. That's the life science or medical uh, devices uh, representative on our parent, uh, on our on our panel. Sorry, uh, she's very experienced uh, compliance uh, professional. Uh, she led the global compliance integrity function for Arecta since 2014 building basically really from the scratch um, a dedicated function and effective programs in areas of heightened legal and reputational risk and anti bribery and corruption uh, programs. And she uh, is also focusing on trade compliance, competition law and data privacy. Uh, we have another in-house uh, expertise we have uh, with Caroline uh, Rees. Um, from Zalando, it will be a challenge for me to make distinguish between Caroline and Caroline. I'll try to do that. Uh, she's also a very experienced compliance uh, professional. She works at, uh, as I said, at Zalando, um, and she is heading the compliance department there, um, or compliance and business ethics uh, departments there. She also focuses on anti-money laundering and customs. Uh, Caroline is a trained lawyer. And she also teaches compliance at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. And she's also a member of the advisory board of Deutsches Institute for Compliance. Um, another in-house uh, member of our panel, uh, or last one, is Lenka Kushnier. Um, she is legal and compliance manager at Porsche uh, CE. 
she's also a trained uh, lawyer, my former uh, colleague. She's advising, and that's, I think, one of her specialties uh, at her current position. She is advising an exceptionally large number of uh, clients at Porsche uh, CE, which is driven by the cross company and department, uh, department, uh, department tasks, international nature of the business and high level of entrepreneurial dynamism of the Porsche group. Um, she uh, is uh, uh, in, in charge of uh, import, uh, importers uh, who are active in 26 uh, markets in Central Eastern uh, Europe. And we move on to the non-in-house expert on our client. Uh, so far, I would like to introduce um, Thomas Brandy, uh, who is a partner at uh, law firm Selmer uh, AS. Uh, he specializes in anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, and sections and export controls. He also assists companies with corporate investigation and crisis, crisis management, one of the reasons why we have him uh, on the panel today. And uh, he has also brought experience in assisting Norwegian clients uh, to tackle various challenges related to fraud and corruption in the emerging markets. And he is frequently involved in, uh, in cross-border investigation, which I personally can confirm as we worked on some of them together. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Zoe Newman. Zoe is managing director and co-head of global financial investigation uh, at uh, Kroll. That's, if I see it correctly, the only uh, non-lawyer or non-lawyer position at, at least on our panel. Uh, she, Zoe, uh, uh, is um, a director in business intelligence and uh, investigation uh, division at Kroll, and she co-heads the global financial investigation practice, and she specializes in advising both government and corporate, corporate clients and um, their counsel in critical matters, and she, uh, as mentioned already, focuses on fraud and corruption uh, and also money laundering mechanism. Um, again, uh, somebody whom we work very uh, often uh, together and it's a very good cooperation. So that, that's a brief um, introduction of the panelists. We will share um, respective information if needed after, after the panel today. Now, uh, let's move on to what we wanted to discuss today uh, with you. Um, we, as already title suggests, of course, we would like to discuss today various uh, compliance uh, challenges uh, which companies are facing or were facing during the pandemic related uh, restrictions over the last year. The idea uh, for this uh, uh, panel uh, was uh, more or less driven or triggered by uh, lots of uh, experience we have in this group um, uh, collected during the time. And um, the, well, because of the panelists, uh, we would like to um, cover the in-house experience, the external experience, and then put it together. On myself, if I can start uh, very briefly with some kind of uh, impression or sharing our experience we have uh, done as an external advisor, advising clients on uh, various compliance matters, but especially uh, I'm corporate investigation, white collar crime lawyer, uh, when advising a client uh, on uh, corporate investigation on web actually conducting in corporate investigation or representing subsequently or at the same time uh, our clients being companies in uh, white collar crime um, proceedings or criminal proceedings. Um, so the very high level summary which should serve as a sort of opening to our discussion is that what uh, we can see in Central Eastern Europe and uh, especially in, in, in some of our countries, I will probably uh, mostly stick to my home country, which is uh, Czech Republic, uh, is um, the following. Uh, we have relatively recently conducted together with um, 
uh, one of the leading Czech economical newspaper kind of kind of survey uh, where we asked uh, ourselves or we were asked the, the question among others uh, whether we see any increase or decrease on any kind of development uh, in terms of um, crimes or not compliant behavior being conducted conducting conducted by uh, employees. Uh, what the uh, outcome of this, let's say, mini survey uh, was, and it was uh, published, it, it's, it's searchable, is that uh, in, in, in the experience of the external uh, advisors who were uh, asked those questions, we think that indeed in certain uh, companies, uh, we can see a certain increase of uh, employment uh, or of criminal activity, uh, which is being conducted by uh, employees. And that the fact that number of employees are um, uh, spending most of the time uh, without, let's say, physical controls uh, at home, uh, for some reason uh, triggered this um, uh, supported uh, the criminal activity and, and we really see it. Uh, it cannot be uh, generalized, of course. There are certain types of activity or criminal activity where personal meetings are needed, like most of the uh, corruption uh, activities, at least the bigger one, uh, there at some, at some point uh, physical meetings are uh, needed. But uh, for some kind of accounting fraud or internal fraud uh, in many, many circumstances, the fact that people are not um, uh, working from the office uh, have the increasing effects on the criminal activity. This is one of the topics we will touch upon uh, today. Uh, another conclusion we uh, will discuss from various uh, perspectives today is that uh, we can see in terms of criminal um, proceedings or activity of uh, local prosecuting uh, authorities, um, we, they are back on track again, unfortunately for, for some uh, uh, involved parties, but uh, we, we could really see uh, some kind of delay in uh, criminal proceedings because for a certain period of time, uh, for example, witness testimonies uh, could not or interviews uh, could not have been done. Uh, and this caused, of course, uh, certain delays in, in the criminal proceedings. But definitely in Czech Republic, for example, uh, in the cases we are working on, uh, the criminal uh, prosecuting authorities are really more or less back on track. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, at the end, the criminal proceedings will uh, not be uh, longer. It will be longer, uh, but uh, the still stand, which we sort of perceived somewhere a few months ago, is not there anyway. Investigations, uh, big corporate or internal investigation, big topic we would like to cover today uh, is very important. So in most of uh, our countries uh, in Central Eastern Europe, uh, it's being understood that uh, to react appropriately to uh, certain qualified, let's say, uh, suspicions or allegations with a proper uh, internal investigation and subsequent reaction uh, is um, an, an ultimate condition for at the end the proof uh, that uh, company's compliance management system is working. We have, as I said, I will try to stay with Czech Republic, not to be too general, but uh, in Czech Republic, for example, really we have since 2016, the so-called compliance defense possibility, according to which companies can release itself from its criminal um, uh, liability if they can uh, show uh, to the uh, prosecuting authorities that we, they have uh, implemented uh, adequate uh, measures to protect the company. We, we call it um, in the methodology with what, which was a shoot, shoot a few years later in 2018 but by the Supreme um, uh, Prosecution Office in which I co-drafted, we call it not surprisingly, compliance management system. Um, so the uh, corporate investigation are really sort of, well, 
let's say, new trend in our countries. They are really being seriously conducted because most of the companies have uh, finally understood they, that they have to, in certain circumstances, lead, uh, really to conduct it. Conduct it. What happened during the uh, pandemics is that the uh, internal investigation slowed down in our experience. And the reason for that was uh, mainly uh, the impossibility to conduct uh, witness interviews in person. Uh, topic we will be discussing today is uh, how effective uh, is the alternative way how to conduct interviews, which is uh, via remote uh, means. Uh, my personal opinion or the opinion of, of, of uh, my team is that uh, it's simply not that effective. You can't see uh, that much body language is missing. You see just a part of the body uh, language uh, on the screen and uh, you, you are facing further risks. Again, we will talk about today. So that we fortunately, I would say for our clients, uh, managed to... Um, um, postpone the investigation until the time when uh, it will be possible again, uh, even under certain uh, restrictions or protective measures uh, to conduct those um, interviews. So we will, again, to summarize, and that's the end of my introduct uh, introductory part, we will try to discuss uh, sort of general compliance uh, uh, issues uh, and um, um, yeah, issues uh, companies are, uh, were exposed because of the pandemic, because of uh, the work, remote working situation. And then we will also um, uh, sort of focus on corporate investigation uh, challenges during the pandemics. Um, well, now let's start um, to second part of our discussion today after we finish the introductory part, uh, which will be that uh, each of us or each of the colleagues uh, will uh, shortly share with us uh, her or his uh, experience, uh, most important uh, and relevant one from, uh, from the pandemic time. Um, I would, um, and I, I think we, we should we should start or the idea what that we will start with the in-house council and then go slowly, smoothly uh, to the internal um, uh, investigation, external specialists. Um, I would like to ask Lenka Kushner, so again, legal and compliance manager at uh, Porsche CE, uh, to summarize for us what in her role, quite a challenging one, uh, the biggest really challenging during this um, period where. Well. well, thank you for the introduction, Itka, and good afternoon to everyone. Well, as Itka said, uh, PCE is the regional office and subsidiary of Porsche AG, and uh, we are located in Prague, the Czech Republic. And we bring together 26 countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we claim that it is the most compelling and diverse and dynamic region in the world. And it brings together not only different cultures and languages, but also different legal systems. And that can be very challenging. Well, at the beginning of the pandemic situation, we of course challenged uh, or faced a lot of challenges as all the companies did. However, today I decided to share two topics with you. One of them is relating to business partner compliance due diligence. And the other one is rather employment related compliance topic. As regards the business partner compliance due diligence, uh, I have to say this plays a very important role in our practice. And uh, prior to the pandemic situation, our professionals uh, regularly visited our markets and uh, conducted personal meetings uh, in the markets. Uh, they provided various trainings, support, we ran a Porsche Business Excellence Program and Part of these activities were also devoted to audits in various areas of business of the importer or dealer directly in the market. 
Uh, apart from this, we also conduct personal meetings with our potential investors. So if uh, we have, uh, let's say, a wide spot market and we have an interesting business partner to talk to, it's usually the Porsche top management who travels to this market and conducts personal meetings with the potential investors as well as checks the facilities where the business partner operates or uh, the facilities from which the business would be conducted. Of course, this became uh, very challenging during the pandemic time uh, due to various travel restrictions and lockdowns. And uh, yeah, we had to consider how to deal with the situation. So. In fact, in relation to the white spot markets, we took the decision to postpone the tenders in these markets because we find it really crucial to personally meet the investors and personally check the facilities and places where the business would be conducted. Uh, as a second part in relation to our current business par partners, we also considered some kind of measures that we could uh, put in place. And um, well, uh, we implemented uh, regular monitoring measures, uh, which are conducted on three or six months basis. We have implemented these measures in relation to markets, which we consider higher risk markets or where we see that we could potentially face a reputational issue. And uh, these monitoring measures are conducted by our external advisors who are actually located in the relevant market and who know the situation in the market very well and who can also speak the local language because as part of this monitoring measure, uh, we also um, monitor, for example, the local newspapers. So this was one of the topics. The second topic, which I mentioned, related to um, employment law and our professionals, because, uh, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had to uh, quickly switch to remote working regime, at least for uh, some time. And uh, as our team consists of professionals from many countries in CE as well as Germany, we of course considered for some time whether we could implement this uh, remote working regime uh, from abroad. And uh, what uh, seems to be quite easy is actually super challenging because uh, what, what are the topics that need to be considered here so that you as an employer stay compliant. So first of all, it is the labor law compliance where in fact you should check not only the home office regulation in the country where your office is located, but also in all the markets where your professionals would be located. Uh, then another part relates to compliance in the area of health and safety. Uh, Again, in fact, uh, you as an employer should consider whether it is possible for you to fulfill all requirements in the area of health and safety. And this goes hand in hand with insurance topics because, uh, well, you might have faced similar situation, but at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of insurance companies actually very strictly limited uh, some insurance products which uh, normally run very smoothly and which are usually used by employers on top of the mandatory uh, insurance. Uh, yeah, then next what needs to be considered is equal treatment, of course, uh, travel restrictions, lockdowns and uh, quarantine measures which were actually changing very quickly, I would say, in certain time or even on daily basis. And then you can really carefully consider whether your employees would be able to get back to the country where your office is. And last but not least, uh, the big topic which should be considered in respect of remote working is uh, tax compliance. And this is a huge agenda and uh, it must be seen 
not from the perspective of the individual, but really from the perspective of the organization. And uh, you, again, should check it not only in the home country, but in all the markets where your workforce uh, would be located. Yeah, so these are the two topics I wanted to briefly mention, and I will hand over to Jitka. Great, thank you very much. Um, that, that's, of course, very interesting. I'm probably Caroline Rees uh, could uh, follow up now and perhaps share, share uh, one of those uh, comments or support them. But in general, Caroline, you seem to be a re real remote worker uh, professional. What are your five minutes high level most important um, experience uh, you would like to share us from pandemics? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, thanks, Jitka um, and Lenka for um, framing these these topics. Because um, yeah, you're right. Um, working uh, at an office job at Salando at this moment means um, working remotely. Um, so uh, we are facing a lot of uh, the challenges that uh, Lenka is mentioning with regard to um, tax and insurance compliance to uh, cover what we call new work. Yeah, for. Um, all the staff that is um, at home office at the moment, and I'm at home office at the moment. Um, but obviously being a, a huge um, online uh, retailer across Europe, um, this also means logistics. Yeah, And our logistics colleagues, so approximately half of our workforce um, doesn't have the choice to, to do a home office uh, because you can't pick and pack remotely. So um, we continue to have a strong um, employee on-site presence. Um, um, at the same time, um, with um, all the central functions, including the compliance team um, working from home, uh, which is a very specific situation, um, in fact, um, that we, um, we never faced before. Um, so my five minutes would be, um, in fact, about how to um, efficiently um, steer investigations um, during pandemic times, yeah, because as you mentioned in your introductory statement, Jitka, um, obviously um, when the first pandemic crisis hit us, we thought it would be for a very brief time, right? So we prepared for returning to the offices within a few days or at least weeks. Um, postponing investigation work, to be honest, wasn't really my was never my choice, yeah, but obviously you saw that you could have online visits, online interviews uh, in due course, which is not the reality. And at that time, at the beginning of the pandemic situation, um, actually what everybody was thinking in the compliance world was, was that invest investigating remotely was literally impossible. Yeah? Um, and um, reality proved otherwise, I believe. Yeah? And um, we, we all were on a, on a very steer, steep learning curve. Um, to, to that regard. Um, so my five minutes would be in fact about um, the challenges, but also the opportunities um, that brings um, remote investigation work. Yeah. So uh, with regard to the, to the challenges, some of them have already been mentioned here. Yeah, You're, you don't have an on-site presence, which means especially interviews, which are the critical, at, at the heart of our investigation work usually. Yeah. Um, um, except for very few exceptions, um, um, are different. Yeah, they do exist, but all everything you learned in your career and experience about Bondi language, and also looking at on-site team dynamics, for instance, um, it won't happen. Yeah, you won't have these insights, um, uh, which is of course a, a strong disadvantage. Yeah, let's not let's not sugarcoat um, that part. Uh, with all of the, let's say, um, more legal and psychological challenges that, that come with that. Yeah, you can't really, um, yeah, you can't really check whether somebody has a technical issue, for instance, um, in, during an interview. Yeah, so people have an option to drop out um, that is not, um, not there, actually, when you're in, a, in the same room with them. Um, so this is one of the major challenges, obviously, um, that you don't get this, this on-site um, impression. And another fact can be that um, gathering documents or, or data can also be more challenging when you're not um, present at the site you are actually looking into. Um, but on the opportunity side, I would also like to, to um, 
to mention that there was a learning that um, in remote times you can be very efficient. Yeah, you are able to to schedule interviews at a much higher pace. You don't have travel time. You don't have to respect geographical limits, for instance, when choosing the interviewer. Um, you just choose the, the best suitable person. Um, and also the interviewers, you will never have, a, let's say, a judgment call on whether it's worth to interview this person, yeah, because it's so super easy and efficient to do it remotely. Yeah? So probably there's also um, an advantage in uh, remote um, investigations. Yeah? Um, plus um, one additional comment on gathering uh, data and documents. If you have trouble to get the information remotely, you probably should have a closer look in whether your control system and access management and data management system is um, yeah, suitable, yeah? irrespective of your current investigation. So this is another chance to, to take a step back and to see whether the this, uh, this scales yeah, in a geographically diverse um, group of companies um, and whether you have all the access rights you, you need and you require. So to sum, to, to, to sum this up, um, I guess there are two, um, two learnings um, or questions you should ask yourself to reflect on what remote pandemic situation means for your um, investigations. The first one is, is there maybe an ally on site you can leverage? Yeah, is there a trustworthy site manager or HR person or um, other contact yeah, advisor? Um, that is uh, close and could have a, um, an on-site look at what you are missing because you can travel there. And the other one is just um, to reflect on what it means for your investigation plan. Yeah? So not to rely on that what you've always done is not true yeah? because maybe you can speed things up or do them the other way around or in parallel where you don't have the geographical limitations. Yeah? So I would rather like to, um, to have an optimistic look on, on what we learned during remote times and maybe use some of the techniques even in, um, in the future. Uh, once we can travel again, still um, my educated guess is that the on-site interview, that meeting with, with people you're interviewing will um, will come back yeah, and will remain um, very, very relevant um, in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are slowly moving also to the uh, corporate investigation part. And uh, in this trend, I'm sure uh, Caroline, of course, will continue. Caroline was, uh, and we are again uh, changing sectors or medical devices. Caroline, what, what are your um, experience or what is your experience you would like to share with us? So hello everyone, thanks for introducing me. So um, uh, I think there are two questions. So the first one is um, sort of whether or not to investigate during a pandemic. I mean, we all know that ourselves as well as our companies are facing unprecedented challenges um, during uh, the pandemic and are mainly focusing on uh, uh, the COVID impact on operations, well-being and safety of employees um, and the new digital ways of working with customers and so forth. So uh, we all know that internal investigations drive resources and frankly can be quite costly. So um, we all recognize that uh, while the focus for companies is mainly here and now, it is a bit tempting to uh, postpone an investigation or sort of delay the start of it. Um, and uh, this brings me to consider a few things in, in connection with such a decision. And, and first thing is that, well, the pandemic is not over. Uh, we don't know when it will be and what a new normal will look like. So therefore uh, it's difficult to sort of uh, take a decision and understand what the bearings will be. And uh, I also think that uh, there is a risk uh, during COVID that I've witnessed myself here in my role that COVID is seen as an exceptional circumstance and um, therefore uh, that certain workarounds could be tolerated. People are not complying with processes as they usually do. And I think that for, for that reason, there is a risk that a pandemic uh, uh, actually can heighten the risk of certain misconduct in a company. 
So I would caution anyone who is considering to delay or even postpone an investigation. And um, I think, first of all, uh, bad news usually don't get better uh, as time goes by. Um, and if the allegation pertains to potentially criminal uh, activities, uh, of course, the most urgent thing, as you alluded to already, GDK, is that we need to prevent further um, further misconduct. So that's a, a first priority to make uh, to make it stop. Um, and uh, also, uh, the del the delay of an investigation also means there is a risk that data can be compromised. Um, individuals can leave the organization. Uh, generally, I think it will be more difficult to gather information as time goes by. And then I also think of um, another impact, and that you think of your uh, stakeholders. There is, as you know, a tremendous uh, increase on transparency reporting and uh, many sort of um, uh, different stakeholders to consider. I think of regulators and enforcement agencies. I have not seen that they have been slowing down their activities and they really expect you to, uh, to take uh, the internal measures as you sort of witness the um, um, potentially criminal misconduct. And I also think about uh, uh, a very important stakeholder that is the board. So I think any decision uh, should be taken by the uh, ultimate authority in a company, by the board to sort of delay or postpone any investigation. And then I also think about uh, sort of other stakeholders such as um, uh, media, investors wanting information and to sort of carefully consider your communication plan if you decided to postpone or delay the start of an investigation uh, and why sort of uh, things were not properly looked into uh, or stopped. Uh, so I think um, my experience from the COVID times is that I do recognize that uh, it is always better to have a face-to-face -face meeting, but I think we have adjusted to new ways of working and it has worked out quite well. And um, I think even if times are turbulent and the focus may be different for companies to sort of safeguard their business, I think uh, individuals have generally been more available this year. So um, that brings me to the next topic, what sort of, uh, the opportunities of COVID, if you may call it an opportunity, is that uh, we have had time in, in the compliance team to uh, work closer with the business because there was less travel, maybe even less business opportunities. So we could do more risk assessments. We could interview um, uh, our, our employees. We could sit with leadership and we could uh, look into past transactions and, uh, and prepare sort of plans for how to improve our program. So that's my sort of uh, final, um, uh, final recommendation that uh, it is turbulent times, but there is also time to tidy up a lot of uh, policies, procedures, and, and ways of working. Thank you very much. Could you uh, perhaps in this sense sort of um, formulate your conclusion that uh, there are mentioned already anyway, that there are also positives of the pandemic situation. As you said, people are more, more available, you have more time, so that uh, this is a probably possibility. And some of the businesses, uh, we see that there is, a, a, again, a, a, a trend going up, but still it's probably, or it used to be, a slower uh, face uh, in, in uh, relation to businesses. That is a, basically it was a good time uh, to take up a certain uh, compliance task, like trying to really uh, remedy or update compliance management systems and processes, because normally I can imagine that there is a more, more push and other priorities than compliance. Can, can you sort of see that um, that, that might be the positive effect of the pandemic situation. Absolutely, I've definitely seen that. Mm. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, well, moving to the external advisors and their uh, experience, um, I would like to ask Thomas uh, to um, summarize his five minutes 
uh, opinions and views on what uh, the pandemic uh, brought us and what, uh, what were the challenges in particular to corporate investigation, but maybe uh, to, to general uh, compliance task. Thanks, Yitka, and hello, everyone. So, um, as uh, Yitka told the introduction, I'm a partner at law firm Selmer, uh, being a, a, an advisor to Norwegian companies on the uh, corporate compliance and investigation area. Uh, and so, my main observation will be relating to uh, corporate investigations. But before starting on that topic, I would like to share some observations on ESG and corporate compliance. Uh, in the context of the pandemic. So when we had the corona outbreak in March last year, of course, it resulted in an uncertainty on business impact for many Norwegian uh, enterprises uh, and um, for companies that did not have in-house compliance resources, uh, that is the vast majority of Norwegian enterprises, corona did definitely put a hold on internal compliance uh, processes. And now that the financial insecurity for many of our important industry no longer is present, uh, compliance is pretty much back to normal. Um, however, we see that travel restrictions have made it uh, challenging to conduct in-person audit of business partners, such as agents and intermediaries. Uh, this is, however, to, to, to my uh, opinion, um, to a certain extent doable on, on digital platforms. I think that the more critical point is the challenge of conducting supply chain audits and factory inspections uh, in the uh, emerging markets uh, in the context of human rights and, and working condition compliance. Um, uh, so there is definitely a lag uh, on this important uh, area. Uh, and I think local uh, third party consultants can of course be engaged and have probably increasingly been engaged in terms of conducting uh, audits and inspections. Uh, but however, for a large Norwegian retailer with important supply chains in the emerging markets, such work cannot be 100% delegated to external parties. So I think that is uh, the snapshot from a Norwegian uh, compliance ESG perspective uh, in the context of the pandemic. On the topic of remote corporate investigations, um, corporate investigations, of course, typically involve some degree of travel and human interactions, uh, particularly for the evidence gathering and in-person interviews. I hear some echo here, uh, probably someone should mute. Uh, and so we have conducted cross-border investigations during the um, COVID pandemic. Uh, my main observation is that it has been manageable, but sometimes also quite challenging. Um, the first main point uh, on what have made it challenging is the confidentiality considerations. So remotely conducted interviews pose certain challenges, of course, to maintain an interview uh, environment that sufficiently protects the uh, confidentiality of the interview. So first, there's a risk, of course, that the interview uh, is being recorded without the company's uh, consent. And third parties may also be physically present within earshot of the interviewee. So securing a robust uh, environment for the remote interview has therefore been key um, but even with, with certain measures on, you cannot be 100% sure that, that there are any um, confidentiality, so to say, uh, challenges. Um, and sharing sensitive information has also been challenging. Usually we would uh, let an interviewee have access to and comment on uh, relevant documents in a physical meeting. Uh, and sharing information during the pandemic uh, has been and can be also challenging. Firstly, because of the sensitivity of, of the documents. Um, in some uh, cases, it may be appropriate to share screens with the EUE or provide the documents on a secure portal in advance. Um, however, sharing or providing documents remotely runs the risks that the EUE takes copies of the document. For example, take photos of, of the screen of sensitive uh, documents. And of course, also due to the number of documents in larger corporate investigations, it may be impractical to share documents. And in any event, the general principle uh, when we conduct corporate investigations is that the interviewees should only be shown documents that they have previously seen or which concern them. And the second main point goes to the lack of physical interaction, uh, which has been previously um, addressed in this webinar, and especially when interviewing key, key individuals to the investigations. Um, 
I must say that uh, having done corporate investigations for 15 years, uh, responding and, and reading adequately the body language is a really key strategic factor when conducting interviews. And obviously it can be challenging to read body language uh, via Teams. So I think that one observation is that remote interviews are better suited to pure fact-finding interviews with witnesses than interviews with individuals potentially involved in the wrongdoing. So I would say that um, if possible, I would postpone those really heavy and important interviews until physical interaction is possible. And then in that context, of course, a key consideration is that what Caroline addressed, if there are any risk for potential ongoing illegal activity, and that interview is necessary to, to, you know, to further investigate uh, uh, that, that risk, uh, of course, a digital interview uh, perhaps may be the only solutions, uh, solution. Um, and as for the remediation side of the investigations, that is the follow-up tasks, um, there are sometimes, these are also sometimes affected by the pandemic situation. For example, uh, disciplinary actions should, to the extent possible, be delayed until it can be done in person. Uh, on the self-reporting side, uh, these processes have also seen some challenges due to the physical close down of the prosecutor's offices. Um, self-reporting by teams in a grand corruption matter is, is obviously not the ideal route for a company. And the big uh, legal question is, of course, if and to what extent uh, the challenges related to the lockdown will be taken into consideration when the prosecutor assesses the remediation efforts in the context of corporate criminal liability. And finally, a short observation on the cross-border cooperation among the prosecutors. We also read in the newspaper that have been examples of challenges among Norwegian and foreign enforcement authorities uh, due to the travel restrictions. Yeah, I think that uh, sums it up for me, Yitka. That's great. Thank you very much. Just here, uh, one uh, comment or, or question, open question. Uh, you uh, mentioned also some of the uh, challenges uh, we are as, uh, as investigators, but also companies um, uh, facing uh, when uh, in situations where the interviews are being conducted uh, remotely. Um, and the question uh, in this regards, which needs to be, and, and you mentioned uh, a risk, which uh, we see as well, that if you are uh, uh, sharing uh, information documents with the interviewed person and the, the person is then taking a screenshot, uh, this document, if, if the document will leave the hands uh, of a lawyer, uh, where it's normally under the, our, uh, probably most of our uh, jurisdictions were represented on the panel protected by legal privilege, uh, this legal privilege will be then uh, uh, not, not given. Yeah, of course, that, that's, a, that's a valid, um, that's a valid point, Yitka. Um, so also due to the legal privilege consideration, it can be a really challenging uh, situation. Uh, I also hear some echo now, so. Yeah, that was me, uh, yeah. not it. okay. So okay. what we really normally do with, with of course, um, in a physical meeting, in a meeting room, uh, sharing information with the interviewee, uh, but of course not providing the interviewee with that information to leave the room with that information. Um, I think that that is that is of course a key factor when conducting uh, investigation, and and you know that control or that sensitive information you to some extent lose by showing information on 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 Teams or a digital platform. Thank you very much. And I think from a practical uh, point of view, um, in in certain countries, so this. Um, increased attention of what we are uh, share, what kind of information we are sharing and how we are sharing the documents or information in general um, is important, um, perhaps not particular, uh, but in particular uh, in relation to countries which um, incorporated uh, so-called reporting duty. Um, 
it's uh, quite a specific in our countries, uh, in some of our countries in Central Eastern Europe, uh, for example, Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, does it. There is a general reporting duty for everybody, only uh, external lawyers working on a case are exempted from, from this duty uh, to report to the enforcement authorities um, any allegations or suspicions when the level is already at the level of suspicion uh, uh, in relation to certain crimes, um, especially uh, bribery, active, passive, direct, in, uh, indirect, um, and uh, we, we, well, one of the one of the one of our main challenges or goals when we are structuring um, internal investigation in in those countries with those reporting duty, and uh, we uh, possibly um, or we are exposed possibly uh, to uh, corruption allegation is that. We really needs to be very cautious uh, not to trigger this uh, duty on the side of uh, anybody. Well, talking about uh, employees, but in some uh, circumstances also uh, board members. So, um, the uh, how to deal uh, with uh, information, especially in times of remote working, um, is really uh, a key. Now we. Move on to, uh, as a part of our um, introductory uh, sessions, the last um, panelist, uh, which is uh, Zoe, uh, who is Zoe Newman, uh, Managing Director from Crawl. Zoe, you, as a, you have a vast um, experience with uh, conducting uh, internal investigation. Well, basically we are doing only this. Uh, what would be your five minutes uh, summary on lesson learned from the pandemic situation? Thank, thank you, Yitka. Um, sure, I'll try and keep this quick so we've got time um, for questions, but I think the, the biggest um, lesson learned sort of picks up, it's not good to come at the end, but picks up on Caroline's point and Caroline's point. Um, a lot of our work tends to be on behalf of clients that have problems overseas in overseas markets. And obviously that's a big problem because we can't get to the overseas markets that we would normally go on the ground to. However, that's not been so much as a, of a problem surprisingly at all because so many corporates now have got good systems in place that have got integrated accounting systems. We can pull the records. Um, emails on a cloud so it's very easy to pull email discreetly without employees knowing etc etc um, again in terms of our external research into transactions and beneficiaries we can do most of that around the world from our computers nowadays and um, the issue is of course getting the records of um, that you know support accounting transactions in the same and uh, we've had to create various clever ways of getting those whether it's through a a remote internal audit that's on our behalf or um, some sort of procurement compliance review etc etc you have to be a bit more clever particularly when you're doing a discrete investigation um, again to go to Caroline's point um, big trend I've noticed over the past three to five months has been compliance being very proactive um, and I think it's sort of almost that point where they've um, had maybe a pause for breath and are able to take a step back and think actually the environment is so different now in that we're operating under it's time to do a renewed bribery and corruption fraud risk assessments it's time to stress test what we've got in place and see whether or not uh, that's appropriate um, I guess the biggest the biggest issue that, that we've faced and seen impacting corporates I guess the, the most frequently asked question probably you, Yitka, Thomas, myself are asked all the time is, um, has fraud and corruption increased over the last 12 months? And, and I guess sort of the consultant's answer is to some extent yes and to some extent no. Um, what it really is, is the situations increased. Um, the situations increase the opportunity for wrongdoers to commit fraud. Um, and of course, you know, that has um, increased enormously. So have we seen a large uptick in internal fraud corruption investigations no um i think probably most of us agree that much of that is only like to, likely to emerge as the world resumes a sort of business as usual operating environment um an internal audit can back out get back out into the field and the external audits are completed on 2020 21 
um, and compliance has got a greater nexus to the business. Um, what we have seen, though, is a huge, huge uptick in external attacks on corporates via organised crime. So it's sort of the external fraudster um, as opposed to the internal wrongdoer. Um, and those frauds have taken many forms, whether they're sort of your classic fake CEO, CFO frauds, uh, phishing um, attacks, email spoofing, whaling, um, where vendor bank detail chain, uh, bank details changes are made. Um, and to succeed, they all rely upon the weakness or, I guess, naivety, if you like, of um, the greatest risk to a business, which is its employees. Um, and, and the frauds of today that do those external attacks are supremely sophisticated and targeted and are hitting thousands of corporates a day to find, you know, the weak spot um, and almost, I guess, behave as a sophisticated international corporate themselves. And those frauds have got much greater in value. You know, they used to be sub a, sub a million. Now we've we've worked um, on ones that are in the tens and even hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of how the corporate's been attacked and breached. Um, and, and the issue is that obviously um, the lapse control environment and the longer employees are working remotely, the greater the, greater the gulf between the corporate and the employee. Um, you can't just sort of knit next door and say, does this look strange to you in terms of an email to compliance or to legal or or just, you know, the, the person that sits next to you at the desk? Um, and the nature of corporates that are being attacked are the big international corporates with foreign subsidiaries, where it's the foreign subsidiaries being attacked. Um, and what we found is in terms of the problem for corporates is it takes longer for those frauds to come to light because there aren't the chats in the corridor, et cetera. Um, and um, therefore the money's gone and it's been dissipated and it's been laundered. So actually getting it back, um, let alone investigating what's actually happened and how it happened. Um, they cannot notice sometimes four, six, eight, ten weeks after the event, um, even when tens, tens of millions of dollars have gone. So I think what we've seen corporates doing much more nowadays is to really make use of the accounting data at their disposal and conduct much more proactive data analytics to pick up patterns, trends, red flags that may be a perfectly explainable if, um, transaction, but so that compliance is more informed with some of these red flags and can um, touch them straight away as opposed to wait, wait for um, sort of an employee to blow the whistle or, or it to emerge elsewhere. Thank you very much, Joy. I have one um, uh, question for you. We we're just discussing it recently. Um, as uh, we are in general moving uh, more uh, to uh, the area of remote working, remote researching or online researching, uh, there is a. What is your experience? How uh, we are when when researching, or for example, background, uh, conducting background searches, um, has the uh, have the outcome of those searches be impacted how we tend to, or especially I would say perhaps the younger generation uh, seems to take the information which is publicly available. So just take it at, at the face value. Um, what, what do you think? It's, it's one of my greatest bugbears, but I think, uh, so uh, it's, yes, I, they've probably been nagged enough not to, um, but um, I would say, what I've noticed is now people, uh, there is so much to access in terms of data online. Um, it gives you, it should be treated as an initial lead that then needs to be followed up with um, corporate record extraction. Um, so, so you know, I, I started out at Qual as an analyst 20 years ago and, and some of our greatest yee-haw moments came out of actually pulling the full file out of the BVI corporate registry because the fiduciary had left a file path at the bottom. Um, so we always sort of hammer home war stories in that regard. But one point I really would make, Yitka, is the ability to um, um, interrogate a mine social media um, is actually giving such more context now uh, to online research beyond the corporate registries. So really being able to mine, um, you know, 
tens, hundreds of people's Twitter accounts at the same time and look at who they're connected to when you're trying to look into procurement and kick back investigations, look to see how people are connected to each other. Actually, it's making, we get it, we, it's, you're able online to get much more context around relationships than you ever used to be able to, as long as you're sort of using um, proper data analytics tools that can really mine that information efficiently as opposed to trying to use the, the human brain on its own. Thank you very much. And I think uh, we are now, because we are, uh, we spent an hour uh, with discussing between each, uh, uh, each other or with the, within ourselves, sorry, English is not great. Uh, uh, now we can move to uh, the discussion and answering, trying to this, uh, answer some of the, or well, we'll see uh, how much we will be able to cover some of the questions. Um, from the audience. I, I have seen it already, they are very interesting. Um, and when the, the first one I would like to start, which is uh, uh, really the, the, the first one in a chronological way, um, um, is a very important one, very interesting one, and I'm sure that everybody would be able to contribute. The question is, um, how is social media impacting uh, how a company handles communication around an investigation when it becomes public, the media, hears about it. Um, this is, I would say, <laughs> a favorite uh, topic. All of us um, have been um, able to spend a lot of time uh, around this. Uh, perhaps, uh, Zoe, because I still see you on the screen, uh, what again would be, uh, would be your um, answer, your experience? Um, um, I think um, it's a big problem. <laughs> um, my, my experience is um, that particularly on leak of information investigations and similar, um, or, or any kind of um, uh, major public relations issue faced by a corporate, um, the, there's been plenty of media reports where um, boards have made um, shoot from the hip statements um, too early um, in advance of having the facts. Um, and then that escalates the whole social media frenzy around the issue. So I would say nowadays the advice is very much to sort of get that initial fact gathering assessment before you do anything on social media. Um, it, it will, is, 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 is my advice. I would just say also um, more broadly as a trend in terms of investigations, um, the um, use of so social media influencers, I've noticed has become much, much, much more topical, depending on obviously what industry you're in, but um, I've seen much more proactive work being done on, on what social media influencers have said in the past and how that can influence and impact the reputation of the organisation. So we've, we've done many more social media influencer audits and reviews to look for sort of how that can impact. Yeah, thank you very much. And also, I think uh, what needs to be uh, taken into account is the fact that um, also the prosecutors are reading the media. Um, and that's, uh, that's why it is really uh, so important uh, to make sure that if uh, before anything on behalf of the company goes out, uh, we are pretty sure that uh, it will not uh, fire back. We had an experience a few years ago where we were um, conducting an investigation which was started by, uh, well, the, the company uh, itself started to conduct the investigation and uh, in an immediate reaction to publicly raised allegation in relation to uh, public tenders or bid rigging, uh, corruption sort of um, uh, allegations. They reacted uh, uh, immediately and saying um, that, um, they will investigate it, that everything is wrong, of course. They will uh, investigate uh, the allegations uh, immediately and appropriately, that they have engaged a big four uh, company and that they will uh, publish the report at the end. Not a good idea. At the end, the report was not publishable, uh, neither in, in a way to give it to the uh, journalist, but also not in the way to go, give it to the prosecutor. But the prosecutor waited for a few months um, and then asked the uh, uh, well advisor uh, to uh, hand over the investigation uh, uh, protocol. But at that time, uh, the, the structure of the legal, legal advice was done properly and the investigation was not done by this 
non-legal advisor, uh, but by uh, us, so we could uh, remedy the situation. But really, lesson learned was uh, it might be emo emotional at the beginning, uh, of course. Uh, it's a lot of pressure there, but really uh, wait uh, to be sure and really uh, analyze the situation properly before you uh, before you make anything. Uh, Public and I'm sure that this is something where also uh, my uh, other uh, panelists would like to uh, cover. Um, I just would open the floor. Who, who would like to react on that? Probably from uh, from the companies. Somebody as well, Thomas, whoever. Uh, from from a Norwegian perspective, I think that it is uh, one observation is that. Um, Corporate criminal matters are handled less transparent and less public than perhaps you would find in, for example, in the US, where you have, you know, um, these plea bargaining matters, uh, where you disclose uh, uh, the agreements and treaties between the corporation and, and the and the DOJ and so on. So, so in Norway, you typically have uh, neither from the company nor the prosecutor any, so to say, uh, statements or or detail leaked in 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 public. So, you know, I think that is fair to say that we seldom see, so to say, social media information regarding a corporate criminal investigation. However, that could, of course, that could change going forward. Uh, but I don't think that social media to, to, to any extent is impacting how, you know, a Norwegian entity would, would go about to handle uh, uh, communications surrounding an investigation because the standard answer would be, you know, no comments and... Uh, yeah, <laughs> so so not much, so to say, public information surrounding these kind of processes in Norway. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would be also interested to to hear a view from uh, from the company side in house uh, views. I don't know if anybody would like to comment. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I I agree. Think twice what you what you publish. Yeah, but this is. Um, obviously something that does not only apply to social media. Um, so um, I think we need to distinguish the, um, yeah, the proactive or the reactive use of social media. Yeah. So um, the first um, thing is obviously you need to monitor what's going on in social media. Yeah. So this is part of what your press department should cover. Um, otherwise you cannot react yeah, to, for instance, false allegations or um, um, yeah. Um, things that are discussed that are utterly untrue and harming your reputation. Um, but for statements, um, I believe it's not so different. To be honest, it feels very different, yeah, because it feels very informal, but this is a trap. Yeah? It is not so different from press work and press statements, to be honest, yeah? um, because you need to be prepared to, to go public with facts and results. Yeah? So, I guess it's, I'm, I'm, I completely agree. I couldn't agree more with, with what you said. Yeah. So um, you need to be ready to make a statement. Yeah. Not only an emotional statement saying, oh, this is shocking for us. Yeah. Um, but a fact based statement. And uh, probably you're not able to do so. Yeah. As, um, as, as part of the management or the compliance team before the investigation is completed. Um, so don't be trapped by the fast pace of social media. Treat it like press. Yeah, thank you very much. And media monitoring, uh, by the way, uh, especially uh, I think Lenka perhaps could uh, could could um, uh, share a few comments with us. Uh, media monitor monitoring, especially in um, I think you used the term white spot markets. And in general, a little bit more challenging market uh, is also, I think, quite important part uh, of uh, what what should be done, and perhaps part of the usual uh, checking and compliance uh, processes. Uh, Linka, how you how you do how do you deal with media uh, reports and monitoring in in your practice? Yeah, uh, well, we definitely changed the approach in this area during the last few years uh, because, um, yeah, I mean, hiring a big international company for compliance screening uh, of a business partner where you have already some doubts 
uh, we have found out it's not the perfect solution and we have to always reach either through this international law company uh, or otherwise to a local council because we found it uh, very crucial that you can learn a lot of interesting things via monitoring of the local newspapers and for that you have to know perfectly the local language plus it's very helpful if the council has a deep understanding of the situation in the relevant market uh, not only the business situation but also the political situation and uh, what is uh, going on in the market uh, for example, there can be already investigations running or some court proceedings which have already some attention. So yeah, we find it very, very important part actually of the compliance due diligence process. And as I mentioned in relation to some higher risk markets or where we already think we might face some bigger reputational issues, we even conduct this uh, local monitoring on a three months basis. To, to be in a picture, to have good picture. Yeah, I think what might be also quite a big challenge is to make, and then, then we are again with the issue of uh, how to take certain information um, at, or whether uh, at the face value or whether a little bit more uh, uh, resource related and reputation related analysis is needed. Uh, it's also very important, I think, to see and, and make the distinguishing between the, the sources of the potentially uh, reputationally damaging uh, situation. And I, I would say, in particular, in our markets, we are now talking mainly about Central Eastern Europe. So we have a number of uh, sources which are um, not independent uh, in their views. Uh, that's probably everywhere, but uh, that's uh, quite a problem in our countries, definitely, I would say. Thank you. So another question for uh, in-house council specifically, which is, it's a broad one, <laughs> interesting one as well. How do you, as a company, create a culture of compliance? So, Big question. How do you make it easier for a potential employee to blow the whistle on an issue without feeling guilty or concerned about their own job uh, security? I think we can uh, answer this question. So it was the question was put uh, for in-house counsel. I think we can especially try to answer it in the light of the fact that the uh, European Whistleblowing Directive uh, will be uh, implemented in all of our countries in Czech Republic. Um, there is a law already uh, which uh, uh, has been passed through the parliament, which deals with the question of protection of whistleblow whistleblowers and specifically deal with some uh, with issues like um, an obligation uh, to implement as a part of compliance management system an anonymous whistleblowing line. Uh, and in, uh, in addition, uh, it in, uh, the law also um, uh, involves an obligation put on the companies to make sure uh, that the allegations are being uh, properly uh, investigated. Um, in our view, those obligations like uh, uh, the, the need to implement some kind of uh, whistleblowing anonymous uh, solution and uh, the obligation to uh, investigate is already in the law. It's a part of the compliance uh, defense regulation. But, um, uh, well, in this case, um, it, it will be even stressed again. So it's uh, the Whistleblower protection is, I think, quite important um, or even more important um, topic nowadays. Um, who would like to take it from, from our in-house council? I can give some preliminary oh, comments if you want, Vidya. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. So uh, I think you covered the basics there, Ditka, and I would like also to say that the fact that the whistleblowing directive will be implemented will not sort of change so much for how we are dealing with these questions. And I think uh, the culture of compliance and the speak up culture, they go sort of by hand in hand. And um, uh, first of all, I think there needs to be um, an appetite 
for uh, people to report uh, on sort of potential misconduct or sort of other concerns. Um, and, and that means that it needs to be encouraged from, from the top leaders of the company. And of course, basically, you need to have the infrastructure there for people to be able to report anonymously if they wish so. But um, so what we have done is uh, since a few years back, we implemented a yearly survey, which is different from the sort of um, all employee uh, survey that is run by the HR function every year. So it's a survey that is uh, focusing entirely on whether people believe that um, in the company, um, leaders and managers are walking the talk, which is expressed by the code of conduct and the compliance policies, for example. And, um, and this, the question specifically evolve around whether employees believe that something uh, would be done if they reported something. And um, uh, these observations that are um, collected through this yearly survey uh, are presented to our management and the board. And we sort of track uh, on a year by year basis sort of uh, how, how they evolve. Um, but I basically think that um, most important is, um, is that not only uh, the compliance function uh, raises the importance of, of speaking up, but that it definitely comes from, from the top and the, the board and the management and, and so forth. Thank you very much. Just one comment. I'm looking at uh, the question again um, and would like to share one particular experience. Uh, when we um, uh, conduct um, internal investigation, we of course very often ask for the information how uh, uh, any uh, suspicions or allegations can be anonymous, uh, anonymously reported within the company. So what, what kind of tools um, uh, are available? and if the employees are really using it. Um, and then, then we ask, uh, of course, for the proof of this use so that we can check that uh, they can, that the reported incidents are relevant in a way that they show that the employees are really uh, trusting the system and the possibility to report uh, via well, anonymous uh, company whistleblowing uh, system or not. What, and this is one of the uh, questions which is being asked also by the prosecuting authorities, by the way, as, as a part of their question, which related to the question whether the compliance management system is set up in a, effectively uh, in a way that the company potentially can release uh, itself from the criminal liability. We have, for example, in one uh, case, uh, we are asked by the prosecutor to show what kind, because we, we, we argue that we have a lot of uh, a lot of information that actually the vessel blowing channel is being used. Um, and then it was a really big, um, big global company. And we were able to provide information, very, very few information over two or three years um, with uh, quite smallish or irrelevant complaints. Um, and the conclusion of the prosecutor was that um, it shows, it, it can be, it's a big company, risk uh, sector, et cetera. It can be that the companies uh, or the, that the employees are really trusting this is the royal channel because there must have been more information. You can argue with it, explain, but uh, that's, um, uh, that, that, that's what happened really in one particular case. Um, and then another sort of war story uh, where again we were conducted, conducting an internal investigation and asked those questions about what, what is in play, uh, place, um, et cetera. We were told that there is a box uh, where uh, each uh, employee can put the complaint. Um, and when we ask for the contain of, of the box of the period of I don't know, one year, uh, the answer was that there was never a complaint uh, filed. Um, which is not positive. And we ask uh, where the box is uh, located. And the, the box was uh, located in the entrance area uh, where also camera was, was uh, above the entrance box. So, well, this kind of reporting uh, really uh, doesn't give the employee obviously any comfort uh, that uh, it, it will be dealt uh, appropriately and uh, that he will be really uh, facing no consequences. Um, in, in terms of feeling guilty um, questions, 
we have again, especially in in our markets, I, I have uh, I have very often heard in, uh, in in the past the comment that people uh, I don't know Czech Republic because of its communistic past past are afraid to report uh, non-compliance uh, because they they feel that they will be reporting on well in the same similar being in the similar situation as uh, previously in the old regime uh, reporting uh, to. to the people, um, to the authorities. Um, I can't confirm from, from my uh, experience, and I'm in this business also for uh, more than 10 years, that uh, this um, uh, is at least now, uh, I don't know what, 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 what the situation was 10 years ago, but uh, now I don't think that uh, that's the main reason why potentially uh, the people uh, would be uh, hesitant uh, to report what what I have seen uh, the, in terms of reasons for not be, being he, has it, uh, be, being hesitant to, to report uh, within the company certain non-compliance is a loyalty uh, to certain people or say false loyalty, uh, but not that they would feel uh, guilty or as as discussed before that they are not feeling um, secure. Would anybody else like to add something on this? I think quite important. Uh, well, comment. I can I can add a few words on that. I uh, my experience is that uh, people are not shy within Porsche to actually raise any concerns they might have. It might be uh, some little concerns or even some bigger concerns. And I think the uh, this uh, line is used quite uh, frequently. Our employees can actually choose whether they. Yeah, want to address a topic um, via a local compliance help desk or directly through a central compliance help desk. And of course, they have the possibility to use the anonymous uh, line. Uh, Porsche uses um, Ombudsman, um, which is actually two external law offices. And uh, yeah, this can be used even in local language so that the employee feels uh, comfortable about um, submitting what he or she really wants to submit. And uh, as you mentioned, it got some, some fear about uh, submitting these tips. Uh, I, I think it's clear and it will definitely apply in most of the companies that there are some, let's say, basic principles of, uh, uh, which are applied in relation to whistleblower system. And unless uh, something is uh, really proven and investigated, uh, it's clear that there won't be any, any consequences. And of course, the whistleblower is protected. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lenka. There is a question which is directed um, directly to Thomas. Um, how is sustainability changing the way in which companies look at their long-term models following a crisis? Wow, that's a <laughs> big, <laughs> big one. <laughs> a big one, and, and, and yeah, and part it can be interpreted in in different ways. Um, I think that uh, well. Obviously, we see a big wave of ESG and sustainability now flowing into at least the Nordics and, and in Norway in particular, we have uh, legislation now on, on social standards coming up next year, uh, uh, legalizing, so to say, the OECD's guidelines uh, on human rights. So that's a milestone uh, for, 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 for a Norwegian legislation perspective. Um, so I think that... Uh, I don't know uh, whether this corona crisis in itself uh, has changed the way companies looked at these their long-term models. Um, from a, so to say, crisis perspective, I see that it has shown challenges to, to, to ensure uh, sustainable practice within the corporations, uh, in more particularly relating to, to human rights and working conditions due to the lack of those really important targeted compliance uh, measures like audits and, and, and due diligence. Um, so yeah, I don't know uh, to the anonymous attendee if that was a good answer. So, but uh, you know, 
ask any follow up question if that was this was too blurry. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, if I see subsequent question, I will raise that. Um, it was um, another question I wanted to quote, which relates to I think process, processing of data. Uh, there were a few questions, some of them relate to monitoring of employees and some of the relates to uh, processing of data during internal investigation. Um, and I think that I'm just trying to find it, but I think on, on uh, one general comment, a um, uh, lot of uh, uh, people do not uh, understand that what we are doing on internal investigation is not monitoring of employees. Uh, monitoring of employees uh, is, a, is a process which is strictly limited by uh, provisions of respective um, uh, employment uh, laws. What we are we are doing is, and monitoring means in most of the jurisdictions I'm aware of on Central Eastern Europe, is uh, sort of looking in the real time uh, what the uh, into the com communication of, of the respective employee. What we are doing, uh, however, uh, on, on our investigation is not monitoring. We are not looking in what the respective uh, employees or custodians are currently doing, but we are reviewing uh, past or historical business related communication. Um, and, and for this kind of exercise, uh, the uh, consideration or restrictions uh, we need to analyze and take, uh, take uh, into account are especially uh, uh, privacy uh, laws and uh, well-known uh, GDPR uh, legislation. Um, and well, to, to, to sum up, uh, you can say that internal investigation must be really conducted in such a way that the risk of breaching privacy laws are minimized. That's, by the way, also one of the reasons why, why we are using uh, specialized uh, technology uh, for reviewing uh, the emails and respective documentation, because by setting up the respective keywords, uh, we can almost exclude the risk that we are, uh, we are entering or reviewing uh, private in information. And all the conditions uh, must be assessed on case-by-case -case, uh, uh, basis. And what needs to be taken into account are on one side, the interest of uh, the company, uh, and on the other side, the interest of uh, the respective um, uh, employee. And so one part of this process, um, how to analyze uh, what is appropriate and can be done uh, is the so-called uh, legitimate interest um, assessment with, with which the company um, have to conduct prior processing the relevant information. Um, would somebody, anybody from the panelist would like to add something on, on this? No, okay. There is a one, uh, uh, another question which I think relates to what we have uh, briefly touched upon. Um, please share your experience, uh, whether is it possible, whether, whether a, a, a NDA uh, is required before a virtual uh, meeting and how to balance between commercial uh, and compliance um, interests. What is your advice to your clients, managers? I think it's more for, for, uh, for us, um, um, external uh, advisors. Uh, Thomas, do you have an idea? Or no, not idea, opinion on, on that? <laughs> I'm not sure if I get the question 100% uh, right. Uh... Well, the, the question is whether uh, a NDA, I think we, uh, if I understood the question correctly, we were, uh, it's possibly a follow-up to what we have discussed when we talked about risks of uh, uh, conducting um, internal investigations remotely uh, and, and sharing certain information uh, remotely. Uh, 
uh, in my in my view, uh, NDA is, is not required, so we don't, uh, we don't need to, we, we are lawyers, we are protected by, uh, uh, by our uh, duty to confidentiality, so in my view, there is no need to, con to con conclude any sort of NDA document, but it was a question asked here. Yeah, I think that's a good, uh, good summary. Uh, yeah. But of course, in a in a corporate investigation setting where you share information, actually, uh, of course, the uh, by sharing sensitive information, uh, you're possibly you know you're no longer a legal privilege on that information, as we discussed earlier. So an NDA will of course not repair that. So it will still be a, a a risk that you know legal privilege is waived by sharing it uh, uh, with you know. Uh, employees or, or, or external third uh, parties. Um, so in the context of, so say, corporate criminal liability matters, uh, you know, a, an NDA is, is, uh, would, would not mitigate the risk that there is a leakage of sensitive information that could harm the organization. Of course, an employee is, of course, obligated to treat that information, um, you know, according to his obligations as an employee. Uh, but as a main point, uh, starting point, we would never, so to say, provide an employee or a third party with sensitive information in an investigation if it's not absolutely uh, necessary. So that, that, that was, you know, my English more corporate investigation than a general virtual meeting. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And as we are see that we have spent our time, but I think that we have... Um, time at least for uh, another question. Zoe hasn't had the opportunity to, to talk for a long time. <laughs> so I think that's a question for you. Um, for example, when starting an investigation, how do you get the right people in the room? What is the best way to conduct forensic analysis remotely? I saw that one, Yitka, thank you. I wasn't sure about whether when they say right people in the room, they meant to do the investigation or in terms of the subject. So I'll answer it both ways. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess, I guess, you know, in terms of um, the investigation itself, um, if you're talking about how do you get um, subjects into the room, the right subjects into the room, quote unquote, whether it be virtual or physical, um, the key question, the key answer to that is don't start interviewing until you've gathered facts to begin with. So you need to um, understand what the issue is, what the allegation is, um, understand where that um, further information might be in the accounting records, where it might be in the um, email records. Then you understand who knew what, when, the circle of knowledge. Then we feed that to you, Yitka, or you, Thomas, or others, uh, and then we then 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 the interviews start. So that's the right way of sort of using the forensic analysis to to get to the right people to begin with. Um, in terms of the right people in the room, it really depends on the organisation. I mean, some some big corporates have got bigger investigations teams than Crop. Um, it's it's being cognizant, really, I think, as to when you're either going outside of your comfort zone in terms of skill set um, or I think most importantly um, cultural understanding um, you wouldn't want to send somebody that had never had no clue about China or no clue about Russia to go and do an investigation on the ground in either of those jurisdictions because they'll go in with their eyes wide shut and not find anything um, so to me it's really being cognizant on a case-by-case -case basis as to what you're in, how, how skills are um, technically as well as culturally um, and where you're coming up short and may need to go outside to supplement that. Thank you very much. Um, we are now a little bit uh, over the time um, and uh, many participants le left already because they have, uh, as, as we have uh, full schedule. I would perhaps um, suggest that we, that we conclude. There are a few questions which uh, uh, remains unopened. Uh, we'll figure out how uh, to follow up on them and answer them uh, and come back to you. Um, before we really close, um, 
I'd like to open the floor for any um, comments, final comments for the panelists they would like to uh, share with us or make. Don't be shy. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I just think that without being doom mongering, I think sort of we're, we're entering into this sort of pause, you know, breathe mode, and it's going to be the next sort of couple of years whereby it, it's really needed to be understood sort of what's happened and how, particularly accounting misstatement fraud, people pumping up revenue numbers, that type of thing. Um, I suspect it's going to be that kind of issue that we're going to be need to be more alert with as the return as the world returns to normal. Exactly. Thank you very much. And I think it also uh, uh, partly at least respond to one of the questions wh whether we uh, see uh, any kind of impact on the level of criminal activity, especially corruption activity um, in relation to the pandemic. Uh, it's probably indeed uh, too early to say first we are still in the pandemic uh, and typically this kind of more uh, sophisticated criminal activity takes some time uh, to be uh, relieved but uh, you all new, uh, read newspapers there is a lot of uh, allegations already for example in, public, uh, in relation to public uh, purchases uh, of uh, well masks for example and uh, uh, similar um, items um, but we will probably see, but uh, from the normal uh, criminal corruption uh, perspective, I think we mentioned it also today, um, I think that corruption uh, is a kind of activity where personal uh, contact is more required than, for example, uh, when we talk about uh, cartel-related, uh, oh, well, cartel-related activity, probably it will be the same. You also need to need to meet with uh, with people and discuss, and there are other kind of activities, uh, internal fraud, where you don't need to uh, potentially, in some cases, uh, meet with people. Um, so we will see. That's usual uh, legal and depends uh, depends. It's a usual legal conclusion. Um, anybody else? Some kind of uh, what comments? Uh, okay. Uh, well, yeah. also, I see from all the, the regards and the greetings from the participants that there is a truly international webinar. I think that's really cool. And the greetings from Ecuador, Kuwait, Morocco, Montenegro, Mauritius, Germany. So uh, we have the whole globe attending. I think that's just <laughs> National aspects of compliance. <laughs> That's true. Okay, then let's uh, let's conclude conclude really also officially. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the attendees uh, for the time they spent with us. Um, and uh, as I said, we will follow up with, uh, with the questions which remained unanswered. Um, and I personally would do, uh, would like to thank to uh, to the panelists uh, for not only for the time, but for uh, efforts uh, they spent and for the experience they shared with us. And I also think or hope that uh, the seminar or webinar was um, was useful for you. And I also hope that at uh, some time, uh, hopefully soon, we will be able to meet in person again. Thank you very much and have a nice day.